A lot of times, my students come to a course in the New Testament presupposing that what makes it significant is that it is wholly other and unlike anything else. What if I were to tell you that the New Testament is intriguing because it is similar and related to so many currents in the ancient Mediterranean? In this video, we're going to see that, academically speaking, uniqueness has played out. Our take on historical criticism will illustrate how comparison helps us appreciate what has made the New Testament so compelling to many then and now. And that's coming up right now. Historical criticism raises questions about the New Testament by trying to situate it in its original historical context. One way to consider this is by asking what kind of timeline and map would help us better navigate the study of the New Testament. So throughout our discussion here and elsewhere, I'll be making reference to dates and places as a way of drawing connections to the happenings around the New Testament. You'll definitely want to practice consulting maps and timelines so that you can commit these signposts to memory. That'll pay off as we dig into the New Testament itself. And remember what we said about that phrase, New Testament. In historical critical terms, it is really a shorthand for thinking about the artifacts, the anthology of texts, and the social world through which some ancient Mediterraneans tried to make sense of themselves and others. That's a lot of history for us to work through, but archeologist Jonathan Reed has given us a nice handle with which to begin to do so. He says that there are three figures who contributed to the shaping of the New Testament. Any guesses? Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, and Herod the Great. How many did you get? As I've noted before, the part of history with which we're concerned is the formative context of the New Testament, with which we'll call the Mediterranean from the 3rd century BCE to the 3rd century CE. It begins with the dawn of Hellenism, a period that takes its name from the Greek word for Greece. Now, prior to the third century BCE, the territories we associate with Greece were politically divided into city-states. There were lots of them, including some you know, like Athens, Corinth, Sparta, Troy. And anyway, relatively autonomous urban settlements like these were all over Asia Minor. And the big political player at the time was the Persian Empire. Think present-day Iran, or if you're thinking more old-school, Babylon. It really oriented the goings-on in the region, that is, until about 330 BCE. By 330 BCE, the Persian Empire overextended itself, and after this time, the Greek city-states would unite under a single banner, along with lands in Persia, Egypt, Asia Minor, and even as far as India. This single imperial culture would reshape basically all levels of society into what scholars call Hellenism. And this was ushered in by Alexander of Macedon, whom you know as Alexander the Great. He was the son of a city-state leader known as Philip of Macedon or Macedonia, who was assassinated by one of his guards before he could attack Persia. Alexander would finish the party his father wanted to get started. But don't get it twisted. Alexander was not simply a brute. He definitely had street smarts, and he was a student of Aristotle. Yeah, that Aristotle, who'd studied with Plato, who'd studied with Socrates. This is important because Alexander the Great was very much a philosopher king, and we see it in the ideals of Hellenism. In these massive land holdings, Greek became the koine, or common tongue and language for writing. The polis, or city, became the standard social pattern replicated throughout the empire. You, you may know this word from Acropolis. An Acropolis refers to a high place, which was well suited for a temple or political office or other powerful gathering place. The Agora or marketplace provided a great space for exchanging trade goods and ideas, just as the gymnasium not only gave space for people to work out their bodies with the classical exercises celebrated in the earliest Olympics, but also to train the mind in philosophy and the arts. This well-rounded approach to education was called paideia. All of these features were by and large found in the polis of the Hellenistic expanse. When Alexander died in 323 BCE, the Hellenistic empire was left with a large power vacuum. The regional leaders of the polis were left to fend for themselves and to fend off those who tried to usurp their power. 
Events that took place in the territory that some today refer to as the Holy Land is a great example of the kinds of things that ensued. This area was among Hellenism's great sphere of influence. In the second century BCE, in the aforementioned power vacuum, this region was contested by two major powers, Syria and Egypt. Syria was ruled by the Seleucid dynasty, and Egypt was ruled by the Ptolemaic dynasty. The areas we associate with the ancient kingdoms of Israel were right in the middle of their tug of war. The Seleucids won out over the Ptolemies, and we have archaeological and textual evidence that point to the implications of these changing power dynamics. One thing that becomes clear is that Hellenism remained politically and culturally useful for greater Syria. So while a local Semitic language called Aramaic was used in Syria and in the province of Judea, Koine Greek remained the language of government business. For example, in the Judean foothills of Tel Maresha, archaeologists excavated a stele, or pillar with Greek writing. On it is an inscription from King Seleucus IV to his viceroy Heliodorus, explaining his desire to further bring the local population under control through taxes and administration. It dates to 178 BCE, and it gives us a window into local political squeeze that the local Judean population was experiencing. This, in fact, is part of the subtext that led a Judean priest named Matthias and later his son Judas to revolt against the Seleucids. Judas was nicknamed Maccabee, which is Hebrew for something like hammer, and he was eventually successful, leading to an era of independent Judean rule during the mid-2nd to mid-1st centuries BCE. The Maccabean revolt and its dropping of the hammer on the Seleucids is often commemorated as the First Jewish War. The festival of Hanukkah further celebrates the faithfulness of the Hasmoneans during this period and the way they maintained worship even in the hardest of economic and political times. This also may be part of the subtext of a curious exchange in Mark chapter 7 verses 24 to 30. When Jesus reluctantly heals the daughter of a non-Judean, that is a Gentile woman. See for yourself. Jesus at one point alludes to the woman being like a dog. Now I'll let you read it for yourself and flex those literary and rhetorical criticism muscles, so take a minute to do that. But ask yourself why would Jesus intimate